the, this opportunity and the pleasure to introduce uh, Kristen Wong Tam, who is uh, a Toronto City Councillor. So we will be listening to perhaps some of the things that the Toronto City Council are doing to improve the, the lives of women and children. Thank you very much. Although you were here for the uh, other plenary right after lunch, uh, listening to my friend Sylvie and, and, uh, and Prabhu, I think we uh, got a pretty clear, clear picture that uh, Toronto may not be doing as well as we should be. So I may not actually be qualified to be standing up here talking about inclusive city building for uh, women and girls in the urban built form. Um, so again, my name is Kristen Wong Tam, and I'm a city councillor in Toronto. I represent a, a fairly uh, large ward, a fairly diverse ward. We've got 14 residential neighborhoods and five business improvement areas in Ward 27, and I'm a brand new city councillor as of two and a half years ago. Um, so it's it's new for me as well. Uh, city council in Toronto has recently received a certain threshold in terms of uh, the composition of women electoral. Uh, success in Toronto. We've ha actually exceeded our 30% our threshold, um, but I can't say necessarily that we've had probably the, the right type of impact that we would like to have, uh, given the political climate that we have currently. Although I hear by hour by hour on Twitter that that may be changing. Um, but nevertheless, I, I, I won't stray for that from Strat. Um, so I, I tell that you that I'm a new city councillor because I'm also a new politician to, uh, uh, to electoral politics. Um, but I actually come from a framework of being a community organizer, and this is something that's very important to me. Um, I actually was uh, very much engaged in the feminist movement prior to becoming uh, elected, and uh, Ellen Woodwards is a, is a name that I, the Woodwards family is a name that I've, I've known for some time, as we all have across this country. Uh, but my, my involvement in city politics is really about community engagement, neighborhood building. I really enjoy those pieces, so the, those are the issues that motivate me as an individual, and, uh, and I think that that's probably where most women uh, come uh, to uh, the, uh, the, the road to city politics from, is that they want to give back to their community, they want to make the neighborhoods uh, that they live in, the communities that they live in better. And so from that perspective, it's about improving the quality of, of life and the standard of living for women and girls. Um, there is a, a very short period of time that we've been asked to, to speak um, uh, to this particular audience about, and so I, was, I think we were given a few minutes. And I thought in a few minutes that I have with, with this audience, I wanted to at least talk about some of the things I think are very important and that they're doable solutions. I don't believe that they're very large, um, you know, uh, pie in the sky kind of stuff. It's just a matter of policy shifts, and uh, although that can be very difficult, there can be a business model made for each and every single one of them. So things that I think are, are very important, and they, these are like probably four different pieces that I think are absolutely crucial for city building, absolutely crucial about you know, changing the environment for women in the urban building, <coughs> women in cities. Uh, one is uh, budgets. I think it's very important for us to get down to talking about money. I think it's absolutely impossible for us to talk about social improvements for women without talking about the budget process. Whether you're going to engage <coughs> in a lens of participatory budgeting and how you're gonna engage your, your demographic is just as important as who shows up and uh, what languages that you have this conversation and whether or not those spaces are culturally and linguistically appropriate, all that is absolutely important. And I don't think that we can actually talk about participatory budgeting per se without talking about um, gender budgeting, right? So I think it's, it's, it's impossible to detach the two. And, uh, and I don't think that, uh, that cities do it as well. I'm, I'm very encouraged to hear that Vancouver is gonna be embracing this in 2013 and, and moving forward in 2014, but Measuring it, studying it, monitoring it, benchmarking the progress is just as important as saying we did it or owning the brand of how we did it. And we can make all sorts of broad policy statements at the political level and say look at how great Toronto is, look how diverse Toronto is, or look how great Vancouver is, or how diverse Vancouver is without benchmarking. So knowing that this aggregate data is just as important as saying here's another statement. And governments are very good I think my observations, even though I'm a new counselor, new politician, is that governments are very good at making statements and making policy announcements. And I think we do it over and over again. It can be the same announcement, but announced across the country in every single uh, intersection about 10 times. Um, so that's absolutely cru crucial and key, understanding the finances. Because you can build the business case for it. 
in terms of preventative costs to, to making sure people stay healthy, investment in recreation services, investment in public health to make sure that we can actually get people uh, out to work in a timely fashion that they can actually engage and give back to their local communities. Um, talking about the violence um, in some of our communities that are marginalized and in the suburban areas, is impo we, it's impossible to have that conversation without talking about what's happening at the, din uh, the dinner table. You cannot talk about violence in communities without understanding what's happening in the living rooms of those communities. Who's there, who's not there, what do they need, how do we support them? And it's not just about gun control, and it's not simply about basketball courts, if you heard earlier. Um, and even the way we actually allocate our money to the creation and implementation and the maintenance of our parks is just as important. I've actually been in a situation where I've described the work that we're doing in Ward 27 in my community as, uh, as Ward 27 is going through a park renaissance. And when I talk about that, I'm not just talking about building passive green pretty spaces, I'm talking about using those spaces to build communities and foster social inclusion. So therefore, if we do have families who want to go out and picnic, and they may not look like everyone else, perhaps they you know, may be homeless, but they happen to be in the park, they're not to be removed simply because they don't look like they should be there, regardless of where they are coming from in social locations or what have you. And that's absolutely crucial, taking a stand and putting your foot down, because you have to do it. And for those who are holding elected office, you cannot be scared. We have to be very forceful, fair, disciplined, and respectful when we push back and say, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna have to disagree with you on this. I hope you can see it my way. I, can hope, you, I hope we can find some common ground in another uh, opportunity here. Um, so finances I, I talk about, and I can't talk about finances without talking about the cost of borrowing or the cost of doing business in the city of Toronto or any city. I think right across the country, municipalities are, are, are grappling with this big issue, the lack of funding for infrastructure, for transit, for housing. You know it, I know it. Community centers are falling apart, public libraries are not being maintained, parks are not being maintained, and yet we talk about how governments have to enforce the people to live under this lens of austerity, and yet we're giving corporations massive, huge corporate um, uh, sort of uh, rebates and programs that will enable corporations to make more and more money, and yet it's the people who have to tighten their belts. So I really think that public banking and public finance is absolutely something we have to put on the table. And I would say that this should be a, a movement that maybe not necessarily led by the public finance, public banking geeks, which I am one of them, but I think it should be actually led by women. Because if women are able to sort of push the agenda forward, push the, uh, push the topic forward about public banking, it will be a, a issue that can be discussed at the national level. So instead of us putting our tax dollars into the private banks and capitalizing the private banks, and then when we need funding, we go back to the private banks and say, by the way, can we have a loan? Even though we just capitalize your reserves, why can we not create our own public bank? To use it as a public utility, to turn that into policy that enforces and unleashes the public good. There's a whole movement happening in Europe as well as America on public banking and public finance. Next, right after the FCM conference, I'm heading down to California to go speak to some very important urban thinkers, um, sorry, monetary thinkers, about how to reposition money, currency, in the interests of the people. So I'm not talking about nationalizing your banks. That's not the case. I'm talking about nationalizing money. So the piece around uh, the official plan, I think Prabhat Koshala was absolutely right. She's absolutely she bang on when she said that the city of Toronto has not once mentioned in the public uh, plan a, a, the word women. It's just not there, we scoured through it. So we actually created an internal working group to how to put a gender lens over, the Toronto's, to over Toronto's official plan. And we're going through our five year mini review, we've been doing this very quietly, and we're looking at every single segment of the official plan for the city of Toronto and putting a gender equity lens over it. So even though I represent a part of the city which is the most development heavy in, this, in the entire um, uh, municipality, we have been working quietly and diligently trying to craft the right language to move to the policy staff and say, look, this is what we'd like to do, and then trying to get that adopted through council. The challenge so far is that we're running into roadblocks. 
no, you don't want to be so specific, is what the policy staff say. This is our planning policy staff. <coughs> we shouldn't be so specific because it, it, you have to include everyone. But, but not including everyone means you're including no one. So those are constantly those pieces that we put together and it's very difficult to tie them together, even in a position of political power, even with a vote on the floor of council. And how can we talk about land use planning, employment lands and development, you know, urban design and street walls without talking about transit? And I think it's absolutely crucial that we talk about how do we move people back and forth in the city, especially in an urban environment that's growing more and more dense. So in 2012, we had a big debate on the floor of council, and it was sort of broken down into some very basic language about whether or not you support subways or streetcars. I don't know if you guys heard that one. Um, that is like the most basic dumbing down of any type of policy you could possibly imagine with, with respect to transit. And I moved a, a very small, friendly amendment to an item that was going before the for council for vote, and I basically said, any decisions with respect to planning and transit, you should put a gender equity lens over it. Simple, right? Mm -hmm. Small, friendly amendment. Well, that was picked up by uh, one of the publishers in the National Post, and he accused me of derailing the transit debate in Toronto. <laughs> I mean, he actually dedicated a whole paragraph to this, about how you know all these other councillors are throwing all these motions around, it didn't make sense, and why can't you just build transit? Well, I, I had a chance to write an op-ed article in response to that. Thank goodness they let me do that. And my op-ed response was basically transit equity and gender equity when it comes to plan to transit planning is actually good customer service. You need to know who you're servicing in order to, to provide the level of service that people need. So if public transit is not affordable and it's not rooted in connectivity and if it's not reliable, then it's probably not going to work for everybody then you're only going to service those major routes where you're bringing white collar workers straight into the financial district, usually onto our central business district, and then everybody else who isn't working in a bank tower, that isn't working in our insurance company, that isn't working right on the grid, is not served. And that's usually racialized low income people and predominantly women. So finally, I want to do a, just give a quick shout out to Sylvia Bashevkin. I think she's done a fantastic job of writing all the books that she, that she has written. And there's one book in particular that she's written that I've sort of taken on as my little Bible. And it's called Women, Power, and Politics. And uh, this particular book, write this down, Women, Power, and Politics. The Unfinished Democracy in, in Canada. This book is talking about electoral reforms. It's actually probably the best book that I've written when it comes to dealing with the issues that we need to deal with to making sure that we have more people elected that reflect broad, I think, forward-making progressive values. And it has a series of, of, of recommendations that are at the back of her book are, that are so succinct. And the book itself is like this thin. But it is clear, it is the best book that I've read about how do we actually ask for electoral reform and what does it take for us to move, um, make sure that more women are elected. And so those are some of the pieces that we're also working on at the City of Toronto. Those are the four things, that's all I got, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you.